Okay, well, we're at one o'clock, so we'll get started. Welcome, everybody, to Networking Action's Daily Dose. Um, hope everybody's taking care of themselves and um, enjoying their families. And I keep thinking that, you know, all the different sacrifices Americans have made over history, going to war and fighting the country and doing all these different things, and all we're asked to be doing is stay at home. And I'm like, if you have a problem staying at home, maybe it's a great time to figure out what's wrong. <laughs> Fix your home life, you know? So uh, it's not so bad. Uh, it's just a little different and being creatures of habit, I think we don't like different. So anyway, uh, I wanted to just start today instead of doing a review of the CARES Act, because I'm sure right now you're getting bombarded with a million decks and a million different pieces of information. Uh, does anybody have any questions that they want to put on the chat or raise around any of the different programs to get finance, financing help? A lot of the information right now, there's, there's three basic programs I mentioned. There's the CARES, the PPP, which is for payroll relief, and that information actually hasn't been sent to your banker. So give them another couple of days. They're thinking before the end of the week, the banks will actually have information where you can get those relief uh, two and a half times your salaries. Uh, then the other two programs, the grant and the uh, um, the other SBA, tip traditional SBA disaster loan can be, you can get a lot of information. I already have talked to two people who've already applied. Uh, in fact, they've had 25,000 applications uh, this week. There's already a three week delay on the SBA loan. So if you're planning on an SBA loan, get in line quickly. You can do that at the SBA's website. But I understand that the grant program, which is obviously less money, can be applied for online. And that's a very quick process. And I have a couple, couple of friends who've already put those applications in last night. So we'll be having a more thorough session on that Thursday. But if anybody has any questions just right now, I'd be happy to try to answer them if I can. Yes, yeah, Scott. Yes. This is Scott. I have a question on that. Is it's been kind of overwhelming. And a couple times on different ones, I've, I've been on Zoom meetings or on LinkedIn or whatever I'm on. And I always say, so I, where, where, where can I go right now? And is that ready to go? And they almost always say, well, I'm not sure, <laughs> you know, if, if it's ready yet. And so the, like the, first, the, the two loans from the SBA that revolve around grants and the traditional SBA disaster loan are ready online at their website. The problem is the, the site has been crashing during the day. So they recommend, a lot of people recommend they're doing it at night. But those applications are ready online at the SBA. The PPP loan is not ready yet. The bill said that they had 14 days to get the bank, to, the information to the banks on how to do it. So I've talked to multiple bankers. They expect to have information late this week, and then they'll be setting up appointments with people to be able to file for that loan. That's the latest I have. Yeah, I got I got a call into my credit union today, to my bank, and just to ask somebody that's knowledgeable, because I, I just want somebody that knows, you know, here's my situation, which, what do you, thinks the best or what are my two best options? Because right, right now it's a little overwhelming. Yep. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, um, I would like to welcome again everyone. I know you have a million different opportunities to be on webinars today. I think I got seven this morning already. Uh, so we're getting a little overwhelmed with people wanting to communicate, but we have such great talent in this organization that we love this opportunity to showcase them. Uh, Jen and I had an opportunity to meet back in uh, last year when we did our webinar series and we sat down and talked a bit and I was fascinated by her, mostly her attitude and her enthusiasm and her approach. So when we started doing the daily dose, I reached out and was very grateful that she took me up on offer. So today you're going to talk a little bit about setting boundaries, right, Jen? Absolutely. I really appreciate these, by the way. I've enjoyed the replays. I've watched almost all of them at this point in time. What an amazing resource for all of us here. So Great. thank you. Thank for you that. so much. So now everyone will be watching you tomorrow. So it's all yours. Take it away. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. I see a few familiar faces and a lot of people I don't know. My name is Jen Godet. I am a transformational life coach and business strategist. Um, I have really dialed into honoring healthy boundaries as kind of a foundation for my coaching practices because my story was that I didn't set boundaries once upon a time and it almost destroyed my entire life, my health, my relationships and everything else. And I'm gonna start today with one of my favorite quotes. It's actually the leading page in my book and it is the secret to change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. 
that is what that those are wise words by Socrates. And I'd like to invite you to just sort of sit back, relax. I have a PowerPoint presentation I will be sharing because today we're going to discuss what are healthy boundaries? Why do we need them anyway? How do I establish them? How do I maintain them? And how do I use the art of saying no constructively to build relationships and enhance productivity and performance both in my business and my life? Um, learning to say no is something that maybe we all already are familiar with and we're really good at in some areas of our lives, but in others, we're not so good. And particularly now, what an amazing opportunity while we're all working from home, some of us unaccustomed to working from home, this is an opportunity to really start to set some effective boundaries that we can then take into our new normal once all of this quarantine situation lifts. Um, so what is a boundary anyway? I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys. Bear with me just one moment. So what are boundaries? Boundaries are basically, if you imagine your fence, um, it's something, it's a line in the sand that we establish to keep what it is that we want to be experiencing inside with us and keep what we don't on the other side. Um, that's a very easy visualization. Most of us have seen a fence before and we use it to keep our property inside our property line, our pets inside our property line, and to have a sense of privacy and security. So when we think about boundaries in other areas of life, the same rule applies. Boundaries are there so we can protect what we do want to be experiencing, how we want to allow others to speak to us, what do we want to be doing as far as in our business. Um, we've had a lot of amazing information over the last few days, and I'm sure there's more to come, on our, you know, 80, the 80, 20%, and what is the 4% that we ourselves should be focusing on. Um, those are all amazing starting points because it's the building blocks for where we are gonna begin when we start to set and honor our boundaries. So why don't we set and honor boundaries? The biggest answer is a four letter word, and it is fear. Any reason that we have to say yes to things that we do not want to do or any times that we find ourselves being a yes man or a yes woman and just trying to people please, all of those things are actually rooted in fear. When we say we want to do, we will do something or we agree to do something that we absolutely don't want to do or that might even be in um, contrast to our own value system, normally it's because we're acting out of a place of fear. So the common fears we experience, fear of rejection, one of the basic, the basic human needs we all know, love, safety, and belonging are basic human needs in addition to food, shelter, and water. So fear of rejection is a big one. This one comes into play a lot of times with setting boundaries with our family, with our spouses, with our children, with our friends. Another reason we don't set or honor our boundaries is the fear of missing out. We all know FOMO. That's what social media is about. It's about showing the good life. And the rest of us are like, wait a minute, I've got like the roots showing and all the things that are going on right now. How do they look perfect? So that fear of missing out. And another big one is guilt. We don't set and honor boundaries because when we say no, many times societally we have conditioned ourselves to feel guilt and shame when we do say no to someone else. It's almost as if I say, no, I don't want to help you, that I'm being selfish, when actually I'm saying, no, I don't want to help you because I'm not skilled at building a fence and I might actually injure myself. So that guilt and shame behind rejection that we've been conditioned to, that's just a societal conditioning. And the good news is all of these fears, all of the guilt and shame and anything else that we use as a reason or an excuse not to set boundaries, that's all conditioned in, which means we can condition ourselves out of it. So let's start with the big lies that we tell ourselves. The big lies are, I don't have time to do what I wanna do because I have to do all these other things for my business. Um, I don't have the money to invest in my own continuing education or my vacation because I need to put the money into my business or I need to ensure that I can take care of a spouse or a family member. Other big lies we tell ourselves, if I take this time or money for me, someone else won't have enough. If I don't work overtime and do, 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 do all the things that I need to do in my business, if I don't do these things personally, then something bad will happen. For example, I'm 
I'm holding on to all of the activities in my business and doing a lot of things that other people might delegate because I know I do it better. And if you're thinking to yourself, hmm, that might be me, it's perfectly okay. Literally 100% of the population has one of these thoughts at some point in time. It's all rooted in locus of control. So sometimes, especially right now in crisis, this is an amazing time to talk about boundaries because so many things are outside of our control. We are under stay at home orders. That's not inside our control, that's being dictated to us. Um, what else? We may be unable to find the foods that we're accustomed to eating. I can tell you, I haven't seen eggs in two weeks. I eat eggs normally every day of my life. So maybe we're out of control where we don't have the normal foods or, or activities that we're used to doing. So when we don't have control of things, we try to exert control. And when we exert control in too many areas, we end up saying yes to a lot of things that we really don't have in alignment with what we're doing. So if you're thinking maybe this might sound familiar to you, you are in the right place because we're gonna go through a simple step-by-step -step process. So number one, really dial in to what are our priorities in life and in our business. Number two, how do I look at my schedule, my calendar, my time, my resources, and honor my values and my priorities and get all the stuff done that I need to get done? Number three, where do I need to begin to say no? Because really your capacity to say no determines your capacity to say yes to greater things or things that are more important for you personally to be doing. And so learning the art of saying no so that constructively we can establish and maintain those boundaries. And finally, we'll have a ton of examples from family and personal life to ways this shows up in business to communication so that we can all learn and grow together. So what does it look like when we're not setting boundaries? We're a doormat or a pushover. We're that yes man or woman. We're putting everybody else's wants and needs above our own. Sometimes sacrificing our health, our fulfillment, our happiness, oftentimes feeling overwhelmed. It might look like biting off more than we can chew, having way too many balls in the air and dropping one or worse more of them. It might look like putting in a whole lot of work into our businesses or into our J-O-B but not enough time in our personal life and sacrificing our relationships, our safety, our sanity. Um, it may look like not having time for the things that really matter most, the things that bring us joy and satisfaction, personal fulfillment, or it might look like us not delegating to other people in our organization so we don't have enough time to get the essential role requirements that only we can do, particularly as business owners, we're not having enough time to do the things that only we can do. So lack of effective boundaries feels like overwhelm. It can present like resentment. Has anybody ever been in, say it's a party or a social gathering, and you show up and you're like, why the heck did I say yes to this? Why am I here? And then you're sitting there and you're putting the happy face on, you're smiling, maybe you're you know, making small talk, and in the back of your mind, you're like, I could be doing a gazillion other things. I could be doing all the to-do list, or I could be spending time with somebody I love, and instead, what am I doing? I'm showing face here. That is actually resentment. That could present as anger. And in the, in the other side, on the receiving end, have you ever had someone at a party of yours, maybe it's one of your child's parties and a family member shows up and you just know they don't wanna be there? Energetically, they said yes because they felt obliged or obligated and they were guilty about saying no and so they showed up you don't want them there because they're bringing that negative that resentment that i don't want to be here lack of presence so it doesn't allow for a really good experience on either side other other ways not setting boundaries might present itself or feelings that we might experience are fatigue depletion like we're stuck in a rut and we know we know we've got more in the tank but we just can't access it um, it might present as being ill or having a lot of colds, and it almost always presents as a lack of energy, as we discussed. So why boundaries? Because if we don't take care of ourselves and do the things that are most important to us and fill our cup, then we can't continue to show up and serve our clients, our coworkers, our employees, our business community, our families, or anyone else. That's why when you get in an airplane, they tell you to put the oxygen mask on yourself first 
before helping others who may need your assistance. Because the reality is, if we don't set an effective boundary and we're all work and no play, over time our immune system falters, we may get ill, and then what happens? We get sick, we can't show up, and somebody might actually, even worse, have to take care of us. Which, for me, that's my worst nightmare. <laughs> Coming from 20 years in sports medicine, I, I do not want to be at someone else's mercy. So the real question is, how do we start setting and maintaining boundaries? It's a simple step-by-step uh, -step process, and we're gonna go through this in detail. If you have access to a pen and paper, I would definitely grab it because the most effective way for you to learn today is to actually do these exercises. I'm a coach. I can yap until I'm blue in the face. I have a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience. However, it's pointless if you don't actually take action. So first, we're gonna talk about knowing your priorities. We're gonna balance our priorities. We're gonna look at our calendar and actually set aside non-negotiable appointments and, and really dial in our time management. And we're gonna learn the art of saying no. First steps first, prioritization. If you have that pen and paper, now's the time for it. I want you to take a moment. There are no wrong answers here. I want you to just take a deep breath and list the five top priorities in your life right now. It can be anything. It could be family, friends, spouse, partner, travel, whatever. Of course, travel we can't exactly do right now, but list what your top five priorities in life are. And on the other side of this, list what the top five priorities in your business are. And by that, I mean top five priorities for you personally to be doing in your business. And I'll give you a hint, it's not all the things. <laughs> Many times we can be delegating or automating. Once we have our top priorities, it's really essential to kind of take a pulse on this. I usually recommend to my clients to look at this on at least a monthly or quarterly basis, but I personally assess these every single Sunday night to start my week with success. Look at your top five priorities in life, and in business, and then pull out your calendar. When you look at your calendar for the next five to seven days, list, look at all the activities that are in there, all the appointments that are in there, and any of the ones that are not aligned with your top five priorities in life during your personal time, or your top five priorities in business during your work time, I want you to circle those or cross them out because these are the things we're gonna to start to cancel. Whenever we're spending time in business, and, and I know many, many people have these. You may be working 60 to 80 hours a week, trying to build business, build relationships, do the networking, close clients, bring people in the door, follow up. And some of us who are solopreneurs or have an active role in our business, also trying to do the client care, um, feedback, all the looking at the numbers, just all the things in your business. But if all of those things are not in your top five priorities for you personally to be doing, start listing those out and thinking, what of these can I automate? What of these activities are not essential and I can delete them? Spoiler alert, email, 90% of email can be deleted because it's neither urgent nor important anytime. Because if it's a client situation and something is on fire, they're going to call you they're not gonna send you an email. So it's about looking at your top priorities, looking at your calendar, your appointments, and what you have both in your personal life and in your professional life, and ensuring that the appointments that you set are in alignment with your top five priorities. And so we do that one step at a time. If you take nothing else away, look at your calendar and find one thing that's not in alignment with any of your priorities, and commit to canceling it in the next 24 hours. This will free up time so that you can slide in something that might not be, be being served. For example, um, my top pri priorities include my spouse, my daughter and grandson, um, and my friends and family extended. However, I find myself in this new normal working 14 hours a day. When I looked at my numbers on, in my calendar on Sunday, I said, wait a minute, I'm working 14 hours a day. I haven't even spoken to my mother in two days. 
I need to have a reassessment of my priorities. So this is kind of a work in progress, and it's a tremendous opportunity for us to really show up and dial in what is important now. And when we cancel the things that are not in alignment with our priorities, that time becomes white space on your calendar, and you don't have to fill it in. I think this is the biggest area for all of us, because many of us put ourselves and our own needs on the back burner. And that white space, we have this burning desire to fill in with something else that's working for someone else or going to serve someone else. But what if that white space became just an open 30 minutes or hour where we could truly take care of ourselves? either by getting movement in, maybe we wanna take a walk, maybe we just want some breathing room. Maybe it's a space for us to kind of connect with, for my, in my example, with my mother. But in those white spaces, as we start to assess these calendar appointments, we're gonna start setting up some non-negotiables. When we think about non-negotiables, those are appointments that we are keeping to ourselves that are in alignment with our top five priorities. For example, in our business day, it's important for me to have CEO time so I can look at my numbers, assess where the low-hanging fruit is, and move forward. I know many of you probably have that scheduled in as well. That is every Monday morning for four hours. I do not do anything else in those four hours because I am responsible for directing traffic, if you will, and being the executive. And that's where I make my adjustments and do what I need to do. It's a non-negotiable in my business day. In my personal life, non-negotiables look like meal prep so that I can have nutrient-dense foods. It looks like my workouts because all of us are, are in here for a reason. We're all really top, top of our industry. We're business owners. We're movers and shakers. But if we don't start with a core foundation of health and energy and we're not sleeping, we're not moving our body and we're not fueling our body, then we can't show up and make the best decisions and have the speed of implementation and the innovation that we desire in our business. So the self-care non-negotiables are things that are going to keep me personally, you personally, the, operating like a well-oiled machine. So think your sleep, your self-care, your nutrition, your movement, the things that really improve your human performance. Because honestly, our businesses are only as good as what we bring to them. And it starts with us. So our self-care honoring our top five priorities in life in our personal time, and then in our work time, honoring our priorities and setting up our non-negotiables. So the beautiful thing is, like we've discussed, we have a blank canvas right now. Our lives have been turned upside down. Some of us are still practicing business as always. I've always, I've always worked virtually in my coaching practice. So it hasn't been as big of a disruption to me. But for some people, they've never worked virtually. And this is a blank canvas. What an opportunity. This crisis provided disruption. It allows us to really set aside that non-negotiable time to think about what are my top priorities in life? Where do I want to set boundaries? What do I want to be saying yes to? It allows us the opportunity to close the gaps in our priorities. Because when you look at your calendar, you think about your week and you think about the things that really energize you and fill you up and, and get you motivated to do all the things that you do so you can continue to serve, maybe there's a few gaps. Maybe you realize that you really haven't allowed time in this new normal for your self-growth or your ability to read the Wall Street Journal and, and that's a key part of what you were doing before. So this is the opportunity to take our calendars and kind of shake things up and put what we really need to be doing. The four, for those of you who are familiar with the 80-20 rule and then the 80-20 the inside that 20%, what is the 4% that you personally need to be addressing in your work, in your business? What is your 4% that's going to bring you the most joy and fulfillment in your personal life? Start closing the gaps. This is also an amazing opportunity to establish new habits. So the new habit that I'm here for is to teach you how to say no from a place of love and service. So like I said, what do you want your day, your week, and your month to look like? What is fulfillment for you? And what do you want to be doing on the other side of this? It really is a simple formula. The art of saying no from a place of love and service that doesn't result in rejection. It, it's, it looks like thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this networking group. 
validation. I understand you're trying to build relationships. It, it makes perfect sense. Establish the boundary. Unfortunately, I have a, conf a conflict in my schedule. Add value. Have you considered inviting Kristen? I saw Kristen was in here. So add value can look like an option, another possibility, a potential, something along those lines. It's a really simple formula because the reality is, whether it's a client that you don't wanna work with, a potential client who's not in your ideal client zone, maybe they're like not even an A, B or C rock, they're down there in the Ds, they're never gonna really grow into what's most important for you and your business. Um, thank you for the opportunity to make a proposal. I understand you have this need. Unfortunately, at this time, we do not have any availability to service your needs and to be fully present. Have you considered going to add a referral here? It could be somebody in like industry who deals with that particular thing. I'll give you an example from chiropractic. Um, I know a sports medicine chiropractor. I'll use him as an example. He works with individuals with active lifestyle. He gets a phone call from a referral partner and says, thank you for the referral, Jen. I appreciate you sending me your mom. Uh, unfortunately, she does not actually fit my ideal client zone and she would be better served by going to chiropractor B down the street. Thank you for the referral, validating the need. I know I wanna be able to serve, establishing the boundary. This is not my area of expertise and adding value, giving that other space. It can look like a whole lot of other uh, examples, but that's a basic formula. Feel free to screenshot it. If you want it later, I'll give you this. Um, it's fantastic. Um, so before I dive in, into some other examples, because I have a ton of them, I'm gonna ask you if you have questions with regards to what we've done so far, pop it in the chat because questions are fantastic and I can really dial in examples as best directed to you guys from interaction. So if at any time you have any questions whatsoever, please pop them into the chat. While we're doing that, let's use an example with family. Many of us have a hard time saying no to our family. Um, we are in crisis, so I'll use this example. My sister called me, they're out of milk and eggs right now. She lives in the next neighborhood over. Her husband's immunocompromised, so she doesn't want to go to the store. And, and of course, delivery is not happening. She calls me, hey, can you do this? Literally 15 minutes ago. Well, I would thank you for calling me. I am, I am understanding the situation. I have been all over the city looking for eggs myself. I haven't been able to find it. Um, I appreciate the need that you have. Unfortunately, I have a commitment that I've already decided that I'm going to show up for. And here is the opportunity to add value. Listen, my friend, who, whoever popped in the chat, they have eggs in Cyprus. Thank you. They have eggs at the HEB in Cyprus. And here's the phone number for people to call from HEB for a personal shopper for those who are immunocompromised or elderly. So it's saying no it's not jumping and doing it's not becoming the hero and doing what it needs to be done but it's still allowing everything to take place thank you for asking me thank you for inviting me thank you for thinking about me i understand that this is what you're doing i'm excited about your party unfortunately i'm not able to come Let's establish the boundary add value I have a question. Would you clarify the 80-20 of 80-20 rule? Absolutely. So the 80-20 rule is basically that 20% of our efforts in business, in life, yield 80% of the results. So if you take that 80-20 rule, which is widely accepted, it, it even applies to our relationships. 20% of the relationships in our life bring 80% of the fulfillment and joy. So within that 20% that brings the 80% result, there's another miniature 80 and 20. So if we're thinking about this, let's use business for an example. Um, when we're talking about client acquisition, we are all networking. So we'll use network in action because everybody's in network in action. All networking groups are not created equally. When I joined network in action, I was in one, two, three, four, five, I was in six different groups. 
of the groups, Network in Action was yielding more referrals than all of the free and some of the other groups that I belonged in. So, or, or that I, yeah, that I had joined previously. So where do I focus my attention to developing those one-on-one -on -one relationships? Of course, in Network in Action, because it's already yielding more results of the referrals that are passed. Two of my networking groups yield literally 90% of my referrals. So those are the, that's the 20%. Within that 20%, there's, say I have 20 people in my group. And I'm, I'm going to use even numbers because it's very easy. If I have 20 people in a group that yields 80% of my referrals, that 20 people, that becomes a new 100%, my one NIA chapter. And of those 20 people, four of those people are my primary referral sources. So those are my that's the 4% rule. Those four people in my NIA out of all of my networking groups, that's the 4% where I'm going to focus my efforts because not only do they pass me the, the most referrals, they, put, they pass me the most qualified referrals. So I'm going to really spend time developing that. Sometimes you might think of that as a power sphere or something along those lines, but I'm going to really dive in and learn how I can best serve them. And when I get a referral that's maybe not as good, I'm going to take the effort and Listen, thank you for sending me Ms. Smith. I really appreciate that. However, um, this was not a great referral for me because I don't work in, I, I'm not a grief counselor. In future, this would be a better referral. Does that answer your question, Julia, about the 80-20 of the 80-20, the 4% rule? Um, so when we look at our calendar, now I make it a point to have one to two one-on-ones every single week in my NIA group because they're producing more of my referrals and I make it a point to touch base with that 4% of people. I'm reaching out be, by email, text, checking in very regularly with my top referral sources. That's just an easy business example. Um, other examples of saying no and setting boundaries, this is the most popular one I get from all of my clients. And that is, what do you do with a prospect or client who when you get on the phone, they just keep talking. Anybody experience that? Um, so when you have that person who they're on the phone and they just yapping and they never really get to the point, it's really, really simple to, to enact our boundaries. What it looks like, it looks like pre-framing the call. So as soon as you get on the phone call, I'm gonna use Kristen because Kristen, you're like right next to me in my screen, so I apologize. Hi, Kristen. I have five minutes for this call. And so what we're gonna do is I want you to let me know how I can serve you best in the next five minutes. When we get to four minutes, I'm gonna let you know I've only got a minute left and it might be interrupting you at the time. Would that be okay with you? And Kristen says, of course, yes. And so then Kristen goes and then I lovingly redirect her at four minutes when she's just off on tangent. Kristen, I understand this. We've already solved problems A, B, and C. I need to know what I can do in the next 30 seconds or if we need to schedule an appointment. So by pre-framing and setting our boundary on the front end, it makes it a lot easier on the back end to get off the phone call. Does this make sense? Another amazing example in business and setting boundaries. You're working. Maybe you have a front desk or a secretary staff member or something. It's a little different in digital. Maybe you're getting a lot of pings on instant messenger and you're with a client. You're interacting with a client either in person or on phone and you're getting pings from your staff members, right? Ping, ping, ping. So what happens when you see those pings or those messages or when you're getting those chat function, whatever you're using at the moment, it's disrupting you. You're not able to focus fully on the person in front of you, the client who you're Zooming with or having a phone call with. If this is in person, maybe it's your secretary walking into your office, hey, hey, Rich is online too, <laughs> whatever that might be, and you're with a client. So it looks like in the moment, an education moment, thank you, I appreciate the, you letting me know. I am with my client A sitting in front of me, and I wanna give 100% of my attention to client in front of me. I'd appreciate it if you take a message and I will get back to them. Well, but she's really hot, you don't understand. She's ready to cancel her policy, whatever it might be. I understand that. Please let her know that I will give her 100% my full attention because she deserves my full attention to her matter. I will call her as soon as I'm done serving the client in front of me. 
So it's a teaching moment for your staff member that you can then train later. If this is happening virtually, the simple answer right now is turn off your IMs. Turn them off, turn off all the notifications and be fully present with what you're doing. I'm gonna use this as networking because we in NIA are all going to virtual networking, right? When we're on in a networking group for an hour and a half or whatever length of time our meeting is, be present in the meeting. We have a lot of opportunity to be distracted. We could be on our phones and doing all the other things, but that's not serving our business partners. So it looks like being fully present and setting the boundary and saying, okay, I'm in this meeting. Nothing that comes across my desk, nothing that happens is more important than what's happening right now in front of me in this meeting. That is a clear boundary. I think I saw some questions. I, I am not, uh, how do you do this from home with your non coworkers, staff, family? That is a fantastic question and I love it. So it might not work as well with toddlers. I haven't got the solution for toddlers yet. However, this is brilliant. When you have earbuds in and you talk, most of our family members don't interrupt us when we're on a meeting or on a phone and they recognize that. So one thing to do is pop your earbuds in and if you're working on a task, every now and then talk out loud because somebody on the other side of the door thinks you're on a call and you can laugh, but let me tell you guys, it works. My husband is working from home as well right now. And he, he walked in earlier while this was going on and tried to get my attention. And I ignored him completely because I'm here present with you. So he's learning that if the earbuds are in and I'm talking, you don't interrupt me. The other thing is, I'm gonna show you, close the door. Close the door. So this is a perfect opportunity also to talk about boundaries in work. I actually did a live on this um, yesterday because it's a big deal for all of my clients. Um, there's two things to really set a hard boundary with right now while we're working at home. Number one, when we are at work and we, when we are quote at home, we have to define those lines and set that boundary. Because as someone who has worked from home for three years now solidly, I can tell you that if you let that line blur, what ends up happening is you feel like you're always working, even when you're not. So this is not the time to be on social media, doing business at nine o'clock at night when normally you wouldn't be doing that if we were going into an office or if it was business as usual. This is the time to say, I'm gonna work from eight to five, whatever your hours are, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna work from eight to five at five o'clock, establish a ritual, because if you were going to a location, you were getting in the car and driving home. We don't have that now. What is your ritual? Maybe your ritual is, okay, I'm done with work. I'm gonna go step outside and get a breath of fresh air, or I'm gonna go wash my hands. Like water is amazing. Washing your hands, washing your face is a great way to delineate work versus play or at home time. The second side of it is dedicate a space. And I saw somebody says they don't have a room to work. That's okay. Designate a space for work to be done. If you live in an efficiency apartment, maybe it's corn, the north corner of your apartment, and that's where work gets done, and reserve the rest of your space for off work hours. Because what happens when we do work, like this is, this is normally, y'all, this is my recording studio, it's not my office, but my husband's an engineer and has three computers going, plus all the things, and he needs the office. So I'm in our recording studio, and those are our two designated workspaces while we're stuck in the house together. And I'm using that word because it is, we are stuck together. For those of you who are used to spouses working outside of the home and now we're nine, you know, 24 seven with them, it can be a challenge. But this is my workspace. And at the end of my work time, I leave this space. This space is not used for anything else right now. It is solely work. And what that does is it allows the bedroom, the kitchen, the living room to be a safe space. And that's where we can de-stress from our day. If you're not used to working from home all the time, or even if you did work from home, but you got out of the house a whole lot, it is critically important because we've been told it's going to be another couple of weeks at a minimum that we're going to be isolating. We're social isolating through April at this point. And I saw yesterday a curve that showed us repeating, like the curve finally getting to the other side, May 12th at the current trajectory. Um, so if this is a new reality for us, we have to define the boundaries now so we maintain our sanity. Time block, 
This is work. This is personal time. Don't blur that line. Space. I'm going to work in this space. This is where I'm always going to conduct business while I'm home. And that is what I do in that space. Don't take it into the bedroom. That's one of the worst things we can do. Take it from a performance specialist. Sleep is important. And if we take our work into the bedroom, we are inviting that stress. And it's more difficult for us to take it down a notch and actually get good sleep. So critical. If you want to learn more about that, that's a whole other topic. It's one of my strong areas of expertise is performance. Contact me outside of here. I'm happy to help you with other tips. So those are a couple amazing boundaries. Um, I'm going to look at the chat. What advice might you have for knowledge workers, people who specialize in a given area relied heavily upon for keeping the machine running? Um, Daniel, I think I need to bring you online for clarification on that. Let me get a couple of other questions first. Um, some of us don't have a room to work, so no door to shut. That's okay. Put your headphones in. Noise canceling headphones are amazing. Um, other things that people have done is put a sign up. You can get a, you know, have a sign up. You can buy a tripod for next to nothing and have work working there. Um, so there you go. But um, if Daniel's still here, I would like a little clarification on your question. You. So uh, the, what, I, what I was commenting on is pretty much, uh, you know, I'm in IT here, so things can break at any, at any hour of the day, right? And money on the spot, as Helen would say. Um, and so, you know, but then there's, you know, things like that are a bit more, um, you know, you, you need to be there. Uh, but then there's, you know, cases where there's uh, maybe customer service after hours, things like that, uh, that, that take place. Um, you know, some people might feel like, okay, this needs to be resolved, you know, right now, this minute, you know, and then, but it may be something that could wait till the following day. Right, so I have two questions to follow up your question. Question one is, if you're sleeping, do you get that notification? And do you magically wake up? Sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in, in instances when we were on call, I, I was on call at, at points in time in healthcare as well. And so it requires discernment. This is the boundary and the, dis the discernment. What is urgent and what is necessary? So um, this is a whole other conversation for me, but when we look at um, the to-do list, if, if you're familiar with an Eisenhower matrix, if not, look it up, it's a fantastic tool. But the decision process can be done very, very swiftly. Is it urgent, meaning does it have to be done right now or can it wait until the next day of business? Urgent versus non-urgent. Do I personally need to handle this or is this something that could be automated or delegated? Important means I need to handle it, not important for this means that it can be automated or delegated. So if it is urgent and I personally need to handle it, you, you do what needs to be done because you're on call and that's your, that's your responsibility. If it's you need to do it, but it's non-urgent, like the world is not about to collapse if the IT goes down for five seconds and I'm in a dead asleep. <laughs> you might not even hear it anyway, but it looks like having that discernment. Is it urgent? Do I need to, can I put this on um, my first thing to do tomorrow morning's list? Does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah, I think I'm pretty good about that kind of thing. So, yeah, it, it really his is. Challenge, about his challenge, out. Jen, Daniela's challenge is he's IT for network connection and he works for an urgent addict, me. <laughs> oh. all urgent. So everything's urgent when I dictate it. Well, well, this is a this is a great lesson for you, Scott, in urgency and allowing allowing that to know. Because here's the here's the challenge with IT and with anybody, even in medicine, we have this. Um, when you're on call in in any realm of medicine, you still might have to drive to the hotel hospital or hotel. There's it, urgent means it's not going to happen right this second anyway. And if you're woken up or you're in the middle of a project that requires 100% of your focus, the brain literally requires five minutes to get 100% into the next area you need to focus. So you might make um, less wise decisions and your efficiency is going to be decreased. So when we think about setting boundaries in the workplace and we think about time blocking, what is most important and most urgent, have that scheduled out every day so you can handle that in your day and then have time for planning. So if it comes across your desk and it's not urgent, it doesn't have to happen right now, but it doesn't have to happen this week. Go into your calendar, for example, for Friday and plan the time that you know it's going to take to handle that and put it in there 
This is really, that's a, it's a whole other area. This is, this is really diving into the time management side of boundaries. Um, so learning whether it's urgent or non-urgent and then important or not important and deciding if it's something that can be done in two minutes or less, do it right then and there if you're already looking at it because you're already interrupted. And it would take you longer to get back into focus and then try to do it another time. But if it's gonna take time, this is where putting the plan in action is in place. And I'm happy to discuss offline a whole lot of that. That is one of my top selling talks actually is prioritize the productivity. It dials into all of that. Yeah, I think it kind of speaks also to, um, you know, what Scott would uh, get on me about sometimes he'd be like, you have to delegate. You know, we just uh, recruited, um, you know, uh, another partner in the office. And so, you know, letting go a bit of, of you know, some of that knowledge and, and putting trust into somebody else, you know, because like you look at NIA, that's my baby, right? I've been here since it was an idea. And so, um, you know, to it, I, I did find myself a bit reluctant to put my trust into somebody and, and actually let them make mistakes, correct them, and then, you know, let them get better. So it, it, learning to let go a bit and trust, and then you could create more boundaries for yourself. Um, it's, it's been a learning experience and it's been a good one. Absolutely. And so I'll leave you with this, Daniel. Um, this is the control issue that we start, spoke about right at the beginning. The reason we don't set boundaries is because we feel like only we can do it and we do it better than everyone else. And the reality is that is not empowering to the people who we are bringing on. We have to let them fail. We have to accept that they're not going to be as efficient at us at something that we're an expert in when we hire somebody to do the job. We have to give them the opportunity. It is a gift for them to be able to take too long to do it, to fail, to learn their own processes. Because in that, when we relinquish that control and we say, great, I'm delegating this to you. I know it's not gonna be perfect, but I want you to take it over and I want you to optimize this so that it could be the best that it possibly can. And, and empowering that person to make their own mistakes and to do their own learning. Because one of the, one of the fallacies that all of us have and it's societally conditioned and we use it with our kids. Like we try to protect our children from making the mistakes we make, right? Oh no, no, honey, don't do that. I don't want you to fall and hurt yourself. Well, the reality is if you let the child fall and they bruise their knee, yeah, it might be a temporary pain, but they learn not to do that again or they learn to do it a different way so that they don't fall the next time. It's the same thing with the hot stove. We don't, we protect our kids against the hot stove, but once they're of age, if they touch a hot stove, I'll guarantee you they're never gonna touch it again. Sometimes as human, we have experiential learning that is required of us. And the delegation allows us to empower others to, to find things out and to navigate in their own way. And believe it or not, I have learned this lesson. I am a control freak, recovering control freak and recovering perfectionist. But when I've delegated to people, while I might be sitting there cringy going, oh my gosh, why don't they just do this? What I've found is innovation and ingenuity cannot be replaced. And they bring some, some creative skill set that we haven't seen, some perspective that we haven't seen yet. And ultimately, it results in improved productivity and efficiency for all of us. I think I saw another question as well. Um, how do you establish this? Clients always think their pri projects are urgent. And I always do. I want to say, no, it takes three days. How can you educate what's urgent and what's not? So that's a fantastic question. Um, education happens all the time. It starts when we pre-frame. And if they're existing clients, it means that you're gonna start setting a boundary. And guess what? They're gonna hate it. Just like when we always told mom, yes, yes, mom, I'll come change your life, light bulb. And now you tell her no, she's gonna throw a temper tantrum. Mom's gonna throw a temper tantrum because you're setting a boundary and she's not used to it. Just like our children. Anytime we start a boundary, there's gonna be some sort of backlash because they're not used to it. They're used to walking all over us. So with our clients, it looks like pre-framing it from the very beginning. And anybody who's worked with me knows, listen, this is a partnership. These are my expectations of you. If you are stuck, you reach out to me. I will get back with you within 48 hours to 72 hours on the phone. If you need a more immediate answer, you need to check, text me and I will answer by text if it's two minutes, five minutes or less in the next 24 hours. So it's establishing on the front end what is an okay situation? What is being stuck? It means you have an action step and you're not moving forward. Um, what is an urgent thing? Um, urgent, emergency, my house is flooding and I need my flood insurance. I need to get it adjusted. I need a service. I need to cut the water off. I need a plumber. Those are emergencies. 
So it really is up to you to start defining what urgent is and start educating your clients on this. And when they call and something is on fire to them, but it's not to you, that's where that no formula comes in. Thank you, Mrs. Smith, for calling me. I hear that this is a serious problem for you. It's an urgent situation. I am currently 100% dealing with an urgent situation. And when I have the opportunity to deal with your situation 100% and give it all of my focus because you deserve my 100% focus, I will do this. The reality is it is gonna take three days to, to fix your, to have a, a viable solution to your problem. Like the more you can front load and, and manage realistic expectations on the front end, it really helps to, to, to handle that. And if you have a resource, because Ms. Smith is really hot and she really doesn't understand why you're not dropping everything, um, you can say, listen, I'm gonna have you talk to my assistant or I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you this email. Here are the first few steps you can take. And you can have a resource. If it's, if it's client management and you do this day in and day out, you know some of the things that come up. So start having your systems in place. Right now, we have a great opportunity to, to maximize our systems and, and really dial in those boundaries and those client management tools. So what are the things that always tend to come up as urgent? Have something PDF ready to go. Here are the first things you need to get together. I saw um, an accountant did this um, when the CARE Act and all that came out, and it was, these are the things you're gonna need for it to have on hand to do the SBA loan application. Get these in order, then call, and I'll walk you through the process. Like, that's great because they have to get all their, all their financials and all those things. It's pointless for them to be on the phone with you if they don't have that because you're going to just tell them, I need you to get this. So start dialing in your client management and really educating on the front end. Okay. Clients texting at night and on the weekend. Don't stop once I start engaging. That's right. So um, honestly, I would love to encourage each and every one of you to have a, this is when I answer and this is when I'm not, boundary, set it and hold to it. Set it and hold to it. No, like my, my phone, every, every one of my clients has my, my phone number, my text, and they can text me at all hours, but it goes on do not disturb at nine o'clock and it doesn't wake up again until 8 a.m. the next day. And it's off on the weekends. So this is about effective communication. No matter what industry you are in, you can set the boundaries because no one expects you to be superhuman and be awake 24 hours a day because that doesn't serve anyone. So it's about effectively communicating when you're available by phone and when you're not. And if they're used to you being available, they'll get used to you saying, I will handle this. Um, it's as simple as in a policy saying, if you send me a text message, I'll get back to you the next business day within 24 hours or the next business day. It's just about communication. And yes, they're not gonna like it. And yes, people will push back. But the reality is, as you set boundaries, and I tell this to all of my clients, and I speak in front of people all over the world with this, when you begin to set boundaries, it gives them permission to do the same. Because when they, they might come to you and go, oh, she didn't answer my phone call, blah, 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 whatever she says. But the reality is when she steps back or the client steps back and they think about it, they're like, oh, she's setting a boundary. What if I didn't always answer the call? It gives them permission to set boundaries the same. And what happens is when we start setting boundaries, we're leaders. Each one of us are leaders. We're all business owners. We're leaders in our community. We're leaders in our family. We're leaders in business. When we set boundaries, that has a ripple effect. It gives other people permission to set boundaries. And pretty soon, everybody's starting to set boundaries and everybody's beginning to fulfill themselves and to take care of themselves. And it elevates everyone's productivity, their efficiency, the ability to serve, and everybody grows. It's that rising tide, right, that lifts all boats. So it's, it's a perfect opportunity right now to establish your new normal. Um, I gave you some tools in this. If you want the PowerPoint or you want some other tools, feel free to reach out to me. I am available. I work with business owners all over the world in this. And um, reach out, I'm happy to be a resource. So many questions at all? <clears throat> Get a lot of great infos. Uh, perfect. <laughs> Rich has my book. This is my book. It has that whole process and then some in there. <laughs> How do they contact you? Go ahead and give us your phone number if you're phone willing and email. email. Oh, yes, oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. 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 So, um, um, my phone my number phone is 713 305 8815. 
please text because when I'm on a call, it's going to voicemail and I cannot keep my voicemail empty soon enough right now. Um, I will, Julia, I will, I will text this and then um, you can get me at Jen Godet, J-E-N-G-A-U-D-E-T at jengodetcoaching.com. That's G J E N G A U D E T C O A C H I N G dot com. Um, where can we get the book? It's available on Amazon, or you can visit my website, jengodetcoaching.com. I'm going to go ahead and pop my phone number in here. Make sure you text me. Let me know you're with NIA. I'll give you priority. <laughs> um, and we, we appreciate that. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share, you know, my, my motto is that if one person leaves and had, has taken something positive away, then it is well worth my time. Well, I think we're going to do far better than that. So thank you for taking the time. Let me give you a quick uh, rundown. Um, tomorrow we have a great uh, daily dose at one o'clock on the same zoom with NIA.com. I have been looking forward to this. I'm terrible at LinkedIn. And I know how powerful it is. So we're going to have a, uh, Tony Harris talked to us about how to utilize LinkedIn for small businesses, and she'll go through all the different uh, avenues, the sales navigator, the membership in LinkedIn, and just plain LinkedIn for us mere mortals. So that's going to be a great session. If you've always wanted to know a little bit about LinkedIn, I promise you're going to leave with lots of value. And then Thursday at one o'clock is another panel. Uh, last week, that was our most well-attended uh, day. Uh, and we'll have another panel this week, which we'll have lined up a, an employment attorney. If you have employees and you want to hear about labor law and things you can and can't do, we have a SBA uh, lender who assists with SBA loans, and we'll have a lot of new information about the programs that are still somewhat vague to all of us. We'll have a finance guy, Scott Bishop, who's done a lot of work around uh, how to get through these difficult times. And I'm forgetting the fourth one, but you'll see it on the email that goes out. So tomorrow you'll see a recording of Jen's call today, along with the announcement in the next couple of days. I hope you all have a great week. Stay healthy, stay happy, and love on your families. Take care. Thank you, Scott.